So I have a lot of mixed feelings on Scoob and I want to talk about it. Um, this isn't really going to be like a full review or anything. I don't have a script, it's just some notes because I had some thoughts and I don't really think that this warrants a critical discussion or anything. It was just, saw the movie and I liked parts of it, didn't like other parts of it. So let's talk about that. Uh, context, I used to love Scooby-Doo a lot as a kid. I watched the original series of Putnam Scooby-Doo, What's New Scooby-Doo. Uh, some of the movies, I loved the live action movies. Um, I think I watched those more than like pretty much anything else. Um, and then I watched a little bit of Mystery Inc. And then I just thought it was canceled after the first season ended. And I turns out later it wasn't. And, you know, it, it's on my Netflix list. Maybe I'll get to it in a few years. Um, with that said, this, so yeah, I have a bit of history with Scooby-Doo. With that said, there will be some spoilers for this movie, As, and when I say some spoilers, I mean the whole movie from beginning to end, whether there's a credit scene, all that fun stuff, basically everything. So if you want to see the movie, then go see it and then come back to this. If you don't want to see the movie, then just watch. I'm going to summarize it. I wouldn't say it's bad or anything. I think it's it's fun. It's worth a watch if you're a fan of Hanna-Barbera, I guess. I'm not really sure. I think the movie is meant to appeal to them. I'm not really sure, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, because... I really don't know what they were going for with this movie. So with that said, the plot. I thought a lot of it was going to be about the Mr. Ink gang as kids, because that's what the commercials made it seem like. And that's not really true. They're kids for about 10 minutes. So I thought, yay, that means that they can actually get to the real meal of the movie. I didn't really want to see another origin story movie. And this definitely isn't an origin story. It's actually kind of the opposite. Not like an ending story, but more assumes you know the origin, but it still showed the origin. I don't know, but... There's a montage, basically, not a montage, but it's like, it basically remakes the intro of the original series in the CGI this film uses, which is pretty cool. There are a bunch of references through outfits, ghosts, all that stuff. It really has a lot of these things that make Scooby-Doo fans smile, which is nice. Um, and then it cuts ahead and the group is having, uh, I think it was lunch, breakfast, I don't know. Maybe it's kind of important that they don't have lunch later on, but so maybe it was... It wasn't breakfast. That's, I don't even remember at this point. See, this is why I had notes. Um, and Simon Cowell's there because, you know, big cartoon movie, celebrity cameo, having celebrities voice the entire main cast wasn't enough, obviously. And he basically tells them that they cannot go big when Shaggy and Scooby are there. So Shaggy and Scooby leave and go to the bowling alley. And that's one of the things about this movie. Like one of the basically plot points is that Shaggy and Scooby are idiots who just screw up everything and they need to grow up and also get smarter. Um, which is really weird, but I will get to why that's a little weird later. At the bowling alley, a bunch of these tiny robots try to kill them, mini chainsaws and everything, and they get saved by the Blue Falcon, who is a Hanna-Barbera character, or specifically the Blue Falcon's son, Brian, and, who is with Dynamite. And then they, that's when this movie basically tells you it's not really a Scooby-Doo movie, it's a superhero movie starring Scooby-Doo, because the rest of this movie is about stopping Dick Dastardly from stealing these three three of Cerberus's skulls to open a portal to the underworld to bring back his buddy Muttley. You don't know you don't learn all this immediately, but it's not really a mystery. They tell they pretty much tell it to you whenever it's relevant. So most of the movie is just them trying and failing to stop Dick Dastardly. He gets everything he wants. Captain Caveman shows up too, which is pretty cool, I guess, if you know who he is. I'm not really sure that the kids today who will see this movie do, but I will get to that, I guess. Um, even I don't really know who he is, honestly. I think he was in Wacky Racers. That's literally, Wacky Racers, see, it's been so long. That's literally all I really, all of my knowledge of Hanna-Barbera comes from Scooby-Doo or Wacky Races or that one episode of Mystery Incorporated that had a bunch of Hanna-Barbera characters I didn't recognize or Boomerang commercials. I didn't actually watch any of this stuff, but I could pick out a few of the characters. Um, so with that said, they fail to stop the dastardly he starts opening up a portal to the underworld or hell. I'm not really sure. They kind of make it seem like it's both. It might not be a bad underworld. Cerberus is there. Cerberus also is like kind of malevolent, but not evil. Um, and basically he saves Muttley. He leaves. He gets captured, obviously, because his little robots, which are kind of like minions, have a rebellion. Also, Cerberus is stopped. And then it turns out that to close the door to the underworld, um, Shaggy and Scooby need to work together, and one of them needs to basically stay in the underworld forever to lock it from the other side. And so Shaggy decides that'll be him. But then it turns out that 
Scooby gets to bring him back anyway as a true showing of friendship. And there's a happy ending. And then there's not really a credits scene. There's a credits montage, which builds up sequels with Dick Dastardly escaping and other classic Hanna-Barbera characters like Grape Ape, and I literally do not rec- remember the rest, joining Blue Falcon's team. It's not really a Scooby-Doo movie at all. There's one part, actually, where Scooby and Shaggy and uh, Blue Falcon and Dynamut go to an abandoned amusement park, and it even has the classic Scooby-Doo atmosphere. Shaggy and Scooby get scared, and you think, oh, man, I can finally get some of that. I can get some Scooby-Doo. And then it immediately turns into an action scene because this is kind of a superhero movie, but also not really, but also an action movie, but not, also not really. There's like one scene where Scooby suits up and it reminds me a lot of uh, Far From Home when Spider-Man gets his new outfit. And I don't know if that was intentional, but it made, it was there. So I want to talk a little bit about the more literary aspects of this movie, I guess. Basically, motivations and themes. When it comes to motivations, there aren't really any. Shaggy and Scooby are just kind of pushed along by the plot. Sometimes they're motivated by friendship. Sometimes they're just not really motivated by anything. At one point in the movie, Shaggy just gets mad that Scooby is going with Blue Falcon. And they fight. And then they make up. Shaggy gives Scooby permission to take off his collar because that has sentimental value to them at one point. Like right before this, when Scooby's getting a superhero outfit. And then Scooby's like, Shaggy, is it okay? Because he doesn't know either. And Shaggy's like, yeah, sure, it's fine. Then like a minute later, Shaggy's like, I was kidding. And no, no, I was kidding. But like, you know, I wasn't serious. And that's meant to be funny, but also serious because it's one of the big things about their fight. But you don't really get the significance of that collar because you only see Shaggy give it to him as a kid. And then it's just, it's this iconic collar. But in this movie, in this movie's world, it's just not really relevant at all. And I don't get it. I also like Scooby is the chosen one. Basically, they never use that phrase, but this is basically as blatant the chosen one movie as it gets. I think there's something really interesting with how Shaggy is not the chosen one and his best friend is. So everyone makes it clear that Shaggy's not really relevant or important to the mission. And that like really gets to him and hurts him. They kind of gloss over that in the ending and then he does get an important role, which is cool. But it was like a really interesting aspect to explore because you never really see the other end of these Chosen One stories where someone isn't chosen. Harry Potter teases it like, oh, what if Neville's the Chosen One? And then he wasn't. And I'm bringing up Harry Potter because that was actually something else that was confusing to me about this movie. I don't know when it takes place. When you see them as kids, it has to take place basically around 2014 or later because Velma for Halloween is dressed up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she wasn't really... Like, of course everyone knew who she was, but she didn't really become, like, a really more popular celebrity, politician, justice, whatever you want to call her. Um, I don't know if some people would say justice or politician, so pick your pick. But she didn't really become that popular, um, as popular as she is today, until around the 2014 era, era when it became clear that, you know, she's the last standing bastion of democracy is what people would call it, I think, or what people are calling her. Um, that wasn't really a thing before 2014. That was like when everything really started changing with Senate flipping. So that's, so Velma's like really worshiping her specifically as opposed to, you know, even the other justices like Sotomayor, for example, or Kagan, who have also records on the same level as with Barry Ginsburg's. It's gotta be around this time period, I think. And also Shaggy references Harry Potter, which is how that connects to that thing I just talked about a while back before I used my worthless policy degree. So this is when they're kids and then they're teens, but also old enough to drive teens. I don't know if it's like 10 years later. It might be like six years later, eight years later, but it's later. And the technology is the exact same today as it is in the future for them. And even if you want to be generous and say that they were eight and then they're 16, or no, let's be even more generous than that and say that they were 10 and then they're 16. I think that's really, really stretching it a bit. But then you could just barely square this into 2014 and then 2020. But again, it isn't really clear. And I don't know. The setting is also unclear in the sense that like you don't really get the picture Blue Falcon's real until his ship shows up. And yeah, if you watch the tr- any of the trailers at all, it was obvious that he's real, but the movie doesn't really tell you that. It's like if you're watching a movie about, let's say... Just like some random kid who plays with a Batman figure and then all of a sudden he ends up in the Bat Jet and they never actually talk about Batman being a real thing. You just know he's popular and all that. And I actually do want to talk more about Blue Falcon because he he and Dynamite have this dynamic that kind of parallels Shaggy and Scooby. 
Shaggy and Scooby are like the best of friends and inseparable, and they slowly do come apart throughout the movie. But then Dynamite and Brian, actually, Blue Falcon's his retired father, so he inherited the mantle. He kind of, they have a bit of an adversarial relationship where Brian just does whatever he wants and Dynamite's trying to be responsible, and they come together in the end, and it was weird because they're not really relevant in the climax, which is also weird because they are relevant throughout the rest of the movie, and then they just disappear and make up. They don't disappear, but they just stand in the background and make up around the climax and then that's that and also blue falcon's really weird to me because i don't really feel like he learned his lesson or anything this blue falcon is a spoiled rich kid he inherited everything from his father he is in charge of basically i mean for all intents and purposes it's a company he has a ton of employees it's pretty obvious they don't get paid enough he is working he he is basically taking credit for everything they're doing they point this out in the movie and I think it's supposed to be seen as kind of funny. I don't really like the implications that they just laugh it off. This movie in general tries to take a really weird stance where it's like pretending to be progressive by pay playing lip services to these ideals, but it just kind of keeps going with these ideals anyway. Like again, there was the whole Ruth Bader Ginsburg Halloween outfit that Velma wears as a kid. At one point, Fred, I think it was, was it Fred Dick Dastardly pretending to be Fred? No, this was the real Fred. Uh, this movie is a lie, if you can't tell. And Dick Dastardly dresses up and disguises it as people allow, which is relevant to something else I'm going to get to. But when um, Blue Falcon and Fred are arguing, Blue Falcon's assistant, I actually don't even know if she had a name because she really should have been more relevant than she was, but she's not Blue Falcon or Dynamite, so I guess who cares about her is what the movie was trying to say. I cared about her, but the movie didn't really care that I cared. She calls, she jokingly... Well, it's framed as a joke. She yells toxic masculinity to try to get them to stop fighting. And then again, there's the whole part at the end where she makes it clear that she and Dynamite did everything. She deserves a raise. There's like lip service paid to these like, you know, how do we appeal to those cool Gen Z millennial kids who are more progressive and hip? Let's talk about things they talk about without actually addressing them. Because I do think you could talk about how Blue Falcon, again, is just, he's basically like a, He's like a CEO's kid who just inherits the company without really having any reason to besides being the kid when there are far more qualified workers who actually care about this job. Okay, so I want to talk more about the Chosen One thing, actually, because I had a thought in my notes that I forgot to mention, which is Scooby is the Chosen One I mentioned. I have said this already, and they don't really ever, you know, focus on this. I think you could point out it's kind of obvious he's a Chosen One because he's a talking dog. Like, you could really roll with that if you wanted. Nobody ever thinks it's weird that he's a talking dog, though. Like, it's never addressed once. It's just normal to Kid Shaggy. And Kid Shaggy does talk to Bounds of Sand, sure. But no one else ever even brings it up. And I did not really get that. Like, if you're going to make Scooby the Chosen One, which I think is, which has been done before, I think that's fine. Like, at least say, you know, well, of course he's the Chosen One. He's a talking dog. Just something like that, you know? And then the other big theme is friendship. Friendship is really weird. I've talked about Dynamite and Blue Falcon already, but Sha and Shaggy and Scooby a little bit, and their friendship thing is kind of back and forth and back and forth. But then the Mystery Gang, they, they're they like punished for not being with Shaggy and Scooby at the bowling alley when that was Shaggy and Scooby leaving because Simon Cowell offended them. And they keep pointing out that it was Simon Cowell, but it's also framed as if the Mystery Gang had something to do with that when they didn't really. And like there isn't really drive for most of the characters. Like Dick Dastardly, actually, he want he wants to bring back Mudley, and that's a good motivation for him. But then Shaggy and Scooby, and their entire drive in this movie is Simon Cowell. And I think that there would be a really funny joke if at one point Shaggy talks about having a rivalry with Simon Cowell. I just love when like characters have rivalries with celebrities in movies and stories and other stuff, especially the celebrities don't appear. I think that's hilarious. If the celebrities do appear, you could probably have a good cameo out of it. But just like as a one-off thing, this is an actual plot point. Like, it comes back at the end, kind of, when they pretend that the villain's Simon Cowell, then it's Dick Dastardly. Um, and that's just weird, because Simon Cowell's kind of more important than the mystery gang. Fred, Daphne, Velma don't really do anything in the movie. They spend a good chunk of it when they are on screen, just driving and getting captured and escaping. And then just standing there while Shaggy and Scooby have a big climactic moment where Scooby saves Shaggy from hell. And it just really doesn't feel like a Scooby-Doo movie because of that. And, you know, I've always thought that it's okay for adaptations to veer off a bit. But I think this kind of fits into the movie's whole central identity crisis issue. 
which is it doesn't know what it wants to be because the first 10 minutes are just classic Scooby-Doo, even if they are kind of an origin story. You even have the gang stop being a fake ghost who turns out to be a thief. But then that's really all there is. The main characters are Shaggy, Scooby, Blue Falcon, and Dynamite, and Dick Dastardly. But the movie's called Scoob. It's not called Hanna-Barbera's Avengers, Hanna-Barbera. When I was a kid, I kind of thought it was Hanna-Barbera, and I think I learned later it was actually Hanna-Barbera. And I'm still not actually sure, so I might just slip back and forth between it because I still do sometimes. But this movie really has a lot of these Hanna-Barbera characters. There's also a really cool scene with Captain Caveman. His whole fight scene was cool. Then he just kind of disappeared from the movie. I thought it would have been really cool if he joined the group. His group in this mystery island that also made me think Flintstones at first. And I'm pretty sure Flintstones are also Hanna-Barbera. But don't, don't check me on that. No, they are. They are. And if you say they're not, uh, you're wrong. So I thought it was Flintstones at first from the sound effects when they visited this mystery island inside a mountain. And it turns out that it's Captain Caveman and he has this huge group and they have this Coliseum fight thing. And if you win, you get to take their giant skull. And if you lose, you probably die. I mean, I'm sure he would have. It looked like Scooby was going to die from that, at least um, when he was fighting Scooby. And he just disappears after his skull is stolen by a villain. Like that would have been a perfect opportunity for him to join up in the end when they fight Cerberus. But that's not really, he just disappears, and I didn't like that. More Captain Caveman, please. He was actually really fun. But actually, since I did love Wacky Races, it was actually, like, really touching seeing Dick Dashley and Mutley reunite. And, like, I don't know if it wouldn't have been if I hadn't loved that show as a kid, but it was like, ah, oh, this tiny thing from my childhood. Okay, back to the movie. Again, I don't know who this movie's for, because if you're taking your kid to see this movie, because it is still a kid's movie first and foremost... I don't think they're going to get these references. I think if you go expecting a Scooby-Doo movie, you're going to be very confused. It does also kind of rely on you knowing who these characters are. Like, otherwise, why would I care about Captain Caveman? Why do I care about this Blue Falcon superhero? Like, he's a character at least, but Dynamite especially is barely there. It's like all these things are just presented in such a way that you're supposed to already be familiar with them. They're not really expanded on in the best way. Like, what if this were like, enter the Scooby-verse, and each one of them had more of the backstory shown and then actually joined the team up? If they did that with Captain Caveman, I would have bought it more, and then they could have brought in another character too, just may as well at this point. Movie was not very long though, it was like an hour and a half, so I guess you gotta make do with what you got, but it just felt like a really weird halfway to Spider-Verse, I guess. Although I will say the way they defeated Cerberus was really cool, they basically did a big Scooby-Doo thing of having him slide on a bunch of bowling balls and then fall back into the underworld instead of actually fighting him because I fully expected a superhero fight and they, there wasn't, which was great. The climax was still weird though because after an entire movie of Shaggy, Scooby, Blue Falcon, Dynamite, Mr. Ink doing nothing, it switches. So you have Mr. Ink with Shaggy and Scooby while the whole Blue Falcon crew is just literally watching everything. Also, some of the jokes were like actually really funny the one that stuck out to me was right at the beginning when a cop is chasing Scooby and says that he can't be a stray if he has a middle name. Like, you know, in all these trailers, I would watch them with my sister and she'd be like, why is he asking for the dog's middle name? You know, that was some good payoff. They kind of ruined it by expanding on it a bit afterward, but it was still funny. There were a bunch of funny jokes like that in the movie. And there was a surprising number of adult jokes too. Like they really did make one of those movies where, you know, the parents would get some value out of it. So I do think this was meant to be targeted at old school Hanna-Barbera fans, but it still went a little bit too much in that direction for me. Like, I would have at least liked if they called it Hanna-Barbera the movie starring Scooby-Doo as opposed to just, you know, Scooby-Doo. Because <laughs> I went in expecting teens solving mysteries. We got teens. We didn't get mysteries. I guess Cerberus technically counts as a ghost. Also, like, just, you know, the whole dog versus dog thing I feel like is overdone. But they could have done more with that because Scooby was not really too involved with Cerberus either. And also the way they defeated Cerberus was like a plan Shaggy came up with because as I mentioned earlier, part of the arc is like Shaggy and Zuby becoming smart because they're kind of dead weight. But like, that's kind of the opposite point of the franchise. Like they're comic relief and they look like dead weight, but they're always the ones who catch the bad guys in the shows and the movies. Even in this movie, Daphne makes a point of that when they're all captured by Dick Dastardly and she tries to escape and she's like, Shaggy and Scooby always find a way out of this. So I don't really buy the whole thing about them being dead weight. And I think part of the problem is we never actually see them solving mysteries as adults. It's just like, oh, you know, the original series happened. Okay, you're good. Like, that's just not really a good way to build up the characters. We could have had those 10 minutes of them solving mysteries instead of, of them meeting as kids. 
like it fit with the whole friendship thing and the friendship theme is like really really ingrained in this movie like it literally opens with shaggy being lonely that was another thing this movie is like really bad with show like you know show don't tell i'm not someone who's gonna like blindly read a workshop piece and say show don't tell too much in dialogue or you're not focusing on what i want you to focus on you're focusing on what the story should be focusing on i don't like that change it that's what a lot of show and tell critiques can be but in this case for shaggy being lonely you literally have him listening to like this literally the most lonely person music you hear in movies you literally have him listening to one is the loneliest number like i just cannot tell you how many movies I've seen where these characters have felt this isolation and that's the song that plays. And there are these other lonely songs. I don't really remember them at this point, but you have a lot of this. And that doesn't really sell me on Shaggy being a lonely kid. Then you see him talk to the sand dunes. Just like imagine if Shaggy were at school and he wanted to make friends with kids, but they just kind of ignored him or they were mean to him. Or even better, he wanted to make friends, but he was too nervous to. That's kind of realistic and relatable, but we don't really get that. We just have, here's a lonely kid, he meets a dog, then while they're trick-or-treating, they meet these three other kids, and all of a sudden they're friends now. Also, like another part of the movie is like paying lip service to the progressive politics things. That was kind of as a joke. These bullies steal Shaggy's candy, and they keep talking about how it's bad for him, and also Halloween supports the big corn syrup industry. And, you know, I think that would be funny, but they just kind of keep going on and on about it, and they throw the candy in a haunted house, and they yell, and they yell that he'll thank them for that. And that was just like kind of almost out of place, really. Also, there were like parts of the movie that just really felt like they were happening just because they needed to happen for plot reasons or something. They weren't even really plot reasons. Like at one point, Blue Falcon is told that he's walking into a trap because they found the second skull. And then he's told by someone who's clearly dictatorly where the skull actually is. And I don't know why they just think, oh, maybe one skull's here, the other one's there. But either way, it's made clear it's trapped. They tell everyone this. He's like, we're going through with it anyway. And then it is a trap. You immediately find out. And then by the end of the scene, nothing changes except Scooby learns he's special. And it just wasn't really necessary. The heroes already know Scooby's special because Dick Dash is trying not to kill him because he needs him, they they presume. But if he needs Scooby, he's trying not to kill him, then why do his robots actively try to kill Scooby with chainsaws at the beginning of the movie? Also, the robots, I don't get. Like, it's clear he abuses them and it's obvious they're going to turn on him. He makes an example of one and it's supposed to be horrifying, but they all just kind of laugh at it getting a new vacuum head. And then that's just the end of that. And then there's not really a reason when the robots turn on him, like they could have focused more on the abuse and them hating him, but I think they turn because they like Daphne, which is also kind of, don't know how I feel about that. It was just really weird, but pretty clearly they, they do turn. Also these robots, like, I think they're supposed to be minions. And I don't like that. Like, have you noticed that ever since Despicable Me, there's been a huge trend of trying to make all these characters like minions? I think that's what the robots are supposed to be here, but they just are kind of there. They're like not really that funny. And they kind of have characters, but also not really. And I just don't really think they were that necessary. Besides the one that saves them because Daphne's nice to it. And also it doesn't like Dick Dastardly because of the whole vacuum head thing. Also, why did they try to take the skull in the first place from Captain Caveman? The good guys try to take it, I guess, to protect it from Dick Dastardly, but like, Captain Caveman's no slouch. It would be better if they just left it there and let him fight off Dick Dastardly and help him. Dick Dastardly can't really do anything without the third skull. Instead, they easily let Dick Dastardly, who's fooling them as disguised as Fred, just defeat him and take it and then destroy their ship. Would be much better if they just left it alone. Also, like, they do make a huge point of trying to stop from taking the skull, but his ultimate goal is kind of harmless. He steals riches from the underworld and saves his dog who has been trapped in hell for literal years, and then they run off and the robots catch them. But for everything he does in the movie, that is like extremely, extremely harmless. Like, it's a lot of nothing for all the buildup. And Cerberus ends up being the bigger threat. And Cerberus, like, I guess is going to destroy the world for some reason, but then they defeat it and then it just, like, kicks Shaggy out when they save him because it doesn't like him. I don't know. It also did not really hurt Muttley, but then it tries to eat Scooby and Blue Falcon. I don't understand Cerberus' motivations. Also, in the end of the movie, like, so the whole climax, Dick Dastardly uses Scooby to open the door of the underworld, but to close it, 
because Alexander the Great and his dog made the store somehow. You need the dog's best friend too. And Scooby also is the last living descendant of Alexander the Great's dog, which is a really, really weird chosen one path to go for. But they did, and that's that. I guess they did. The problem is, since someone needs to be on the side of the door, that means they're going to be stuck there. And I don't really see how that's a test of friendship. Like, wouldn't the ultimate friendship be, you know, let's seal the store together and save the world, not... So you're, one of us is going to have to rot in hell for eternity, and it should not be the one with a longer lifespan. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Just Scooby-Doo really should have been the one to be condemned to hell, I guess. <laughs> That's terrible. But then after that, there's another statue that shows up, and it's like, oh, Scooby, you can save Shaggy after all. And he does, and... I guess that's the ultimate friendship test, but that's like a really crummy test. Like, what if Scooby didn't actually care that much for Shaggy and he just didn't save him? Then Shaggy, meanwhile, just sacrificed himself to the underworld forever for Scooby. That's like a really, really bad system. That's like Prisoner's Dilemma, actually. It's punishing the guy who did the right thing, kind of. Well, that's not really Prisoner's Dilemma. Okay, I guess I'm explaining Prisoner's Dilemma in a video about the new Scooby-Doo movie. So basically, two prisoners are captured and interrogated, and they did some bad stuff. They were they were captured on lighter stuff, though. So the idea is if one of them squeals and the other one doesn't, then the one who squeals gets off with a much lighter sentence, and the one who doesn't gets off with a much harsher sentence. But if both of them squeal, then both of them get the harshest sentence. But if neither one of them squeals, then they both get light sentences, but not as light as if only one of them squeals. So the idea is like a risk reward thing. And it's kind of, it's about human nature too. And of course there are a bunch of other factors that you have to take into account. Like, well, what happens when you're outside anyway? What if this is like mob stuff? There's like plenty of works that cover prisoner's dilemma. It's just game theory. This is me flexing my political science degree again, doing something with it, making a video essay about Scooby-Doo. This degree I spent four years for. So Scooby and Shaggy, the way this Christmas dilemma they're in, one of them has to go into hell and then just hope the other one's gonna let them out. And the idea is basically neither one, like they're both making sacrifices, I guess. This isn't a one-to-one one -one situation, but just imagine it. But if Scooby squeals, then he can just like walk right off and then Shaggy is stuck. It's not true Prisoner's Dilemma because there's extra benefit if you squeal while the other one doesn't. And Scooby doesn't really have extra benefit from not having his best friend with him. But like, what if they have a fight earlier in the movie, which I also didn't really buy. Like Shaggy literally tells him to choose between Blue Falcon and him. What if like Scooby was still mad from that fight and was like, Roof, I'm leaving you in hell, Raggy. Like, what then? I don't, that could have happened. Also, like, this is just a really weird movie if it's not obvious. At one point, Scooby asks why they're taking on Cerberus, and I'm just like, you know, same. Also, there's, like, another thing where the mystery machine is destroyed, and I feel like that's used as the climax a lot. I cannot name any specific examples where that happens, but, like, I feel like it's in a lot of the movies and probably a show or two as well. And, like, that's meant to drive Fred, and he has, like, this mini Captain America thing, and it's all a joke because he's immediately defeated by Cerberus because you know it's Cerberus but I just feel like can we have a Scooby-Doo movie where the mystery machine isn't destroyed is that too much to ask for it was just like really weird also Fred gets a really brand new car that has the mystery machine's colors later on it's so, like did he actually care about the van because I know that I've definitely seen stuff before where he cares about that van specifically and most of the upgrades come to that one instead of a brand new car that's like painted over and it just feels really it's like a weird thing, like he just wants a cool car, I guess. That's nice, but okay. Also, like the Mystery Machine, just like the rest of the Mystery Gang, is barely in the movie, so I didn't really feel that bad when it was destroyed. Also, like, it's the Mystery Machine, of course it's gonna come back. Like, it's just like they're not gonna leave Shaggy in hell, unless they wanted to hook for a sequel, obviously. And this is apparently supposed to start a shared Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe. So, you know, that could have been the hook for the sequel, but... I don't know. This just felt like the Batman vs Superman of that. Why not have a Scooby Doo movie and then a and then a Blue Falcon movie and then uh, you know Wacky Races or even just Dick Dastardly movie and then a Captain Caveman movie and then have them all to come come together in this. That's not what happened. It's just like all of them coming together when I just wanted to watch Scooby Doo. 
Also, like, my last thoughts really are two things. First of all, I want to address the voice actors. Everyone's really sad about Shaggy not being Matthew Lillard. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm sorry if I didn't. I kind of, like, yeah, sure, he's my Shaggy, too. Like I said, I loved the live-action movies long before all those memes happened. And then I just got used to him being the voice of Shaggy as I watched later Scooby-Doo stuff. And also, like, the original Shaggy, Casey Kasem, like, sounds a little weird to me now, like, a little too deep, I think. But I got, either way, that's too shaggy to me. That's fine. The shaggy was all right. Fred was all right. I think Fred was Zac Efron. I know he's one of them. I don't really know celebrities that well. Daphne was pretty good. Scooby was the original voice. That's fine. Velma was Gina Rodriguez. And she actually had a really great job as Velma. She just didn't sound at all like Velma. But like her acting was still really good. I'm not traditionalist or anything. But I just don't like when they decide, oh, you know, these anime movies aren't going to capture any kids unless, and adults aren't going to want to see it unless you just put in these names they recognize. Like, I feel like that can potentially suck the passion out of it. And this movie didn't really feel like it was soulless or passionless or anything. They were definitely, this was made by fans of Hanna-Barbera for kids and fans of Hanna-Barbera, but also specifically kids who are fans of Hanna-Barbera, I guess, that very narrow demographic when in, when we're in 2020. And I don't know, it was just like, I think they could have stuck to the original cast. I don't really know if seeing Zac Efron in a Scooby-Doo movie is gonna sell that many more tickets, especially because, you know, it's like people know what Scooby-Doo is. I would imagine that's why they put all the rest of this. We're gonna build the universe thing in here. Also, like, the credit sequence showed Dick Dashley escaping, and you could save that for the sequel, I guess. Like, it just feels like you make the huge, a huge point of all this happening, and then it's just, oh, it didn't really matter in the end. The only difference is between point A and point B. Like, Mystery Inc. still makes it big, but I guess without Simon Cowell, and they don't really explain how they've made it big, but they have. Uh, maybe Blue Falcon sponsored them, but I didn't really get that. And then Mutley is not in hell anymore, and those are the two big differences from beginning to end of the movie. It doesn't really feel like much happened in the grand scheme of things, which, you know, is fine. I just like, again, would have preferred they put this in another movie because, again, I liked Wacky Races as a kid, but like not enough that I would really want to go watch a movie about it. Maybe that's why they did this, but like if they want to make the shared universe, they're eventually going to have to do this unless they just like make Flintstones and Yogi Bear and Jetsons and then throw in... Um, Penelope Pitstop or that other guy or the other people. I think there were like mobsters in that show. I barely remember. It's been so long. I knew they weren't going to do this as soon as I had the thought, but I just kept thinking, what if Blue Falcon's the twist villain? And like, you know, maybe if it were a Disney movie, they would have done that. And there was no possible way they were going to make Blue Falcon the villain. But I was like, well, you know, but it is his son, Brian. And Brian like, has all these problems. And maybe it would it would make some sense, especially, you know, it would have also feel like Dick Dusty just being really, really... Again, harmless in the end, um, despite trying to kill everyone several times and being almost successful with that. I think it would have worked, but they couldn't do that because they need him for their shared universe and for his Avengers team, I guess. And it was just like weird to me, I guess. And then like there was also this mini twist where like, you know, Dick Dastardly is actually Simon Cowell. And, you know, again, I mentioned that earlier when I saw you got Simon. That was like hilarious. I thought, does this work with the movie? Because it was obvious they weren't going to commit to that. And it doesn't work because then the reunion with Mutley would have just like been ruined. Cause that thing was like actually pretty emotional. Again, if you have connection attachments to these characters, if you don't, I don't know if it's gonna do that same thing for you. But then it actually is Dick Dastardly's like, no one expects the double unmasking. And I'm pretty sure I've seen that in a lot of Warner Brothers movies, including a Scooby-Doo movie or two. Like, you know, that's a decent joke, but maybe don't do it without self-awareness in a Scooby-Doo movie when you've done it previously in Scooby-Doo movies. I've been talking down about this movie a lot, but like, it wasn't bad. I just, it wasn't what I expected and that was kind of unfortunate to me. I think they are still making like these yearly Scooby-Doo movies with a bunch of these like different celebrity cameos and other settings. Like I know there was a WrestleMania one, I think. And I'm just not interested in those at all. Um, I was only watching this cause like, oh, big theatrical release. Maybe that means something. And, you know, it was fine. Like, again, I laughed at a lot of different parts of the movie and there were other parts when I wanted to laugh and there were parts when I didn't want to laugh, but the movie wanted me to. And I thought it was like, okay. I thought like, 
wow, they really just said no Falcon around in a Scooby-Doo movie. That was pretty funny. So it wasn't really, it wasn't bad overall. I'm just like really, really conflicted on it. You know, if you want to watch it, go watch it. And if you don't, hopefully this jumbled mess helped. I just like really wanted to talk about it because it was not at all what I expected. And I don't really know if I feel better off having seen it or worse off having seen it. And like, I know they've already been doing a lot of experimental stuff with Scooby-Doo lately. Like there was a comic series about fighting zombies that I actually kind of want to read. So I feel like they could really, if they want to do something different than just, you know, teen solving mysteries, I think they could, but I wasn't really a fan of this different, but it was still, I mean, it was all right. You know, they didn't release it in theaters because of the whole pandemic. And I probably would have felt a little bit less pleased if I'd left my house for it. <laughs> So, you know, that's fine. I think they're making Tom and Jerry next, and I really guess I'll need to see how they handle that. Tom and Jerry is like something that I don't think has aged very well at all. Part of that's from like changes on, you know, violence, because that show was kind of violent, but you know, it was fun to me as a kid. But like also, there's just like a lot of racist stuff in that show, sexist stuff in that show. I was like re-watching some of it and it really isn't watchable in this decade anymore. So I really am curious to see how they make that. I know they've been making a bunch of regular Tom and Jerry movies, like Tom and Jerry meets Sherlock Holmes, Tom and Jerry and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Tom and Jerry and the Hunger Games. And I don't know anything about these movies. I don't have any interest in watching them, but if they're making a big theatrical one, I just don't know if, they could really do that in a satisfying way. But I guess we'll see what happens with that. Those were a bunch of ramblings I had from seeing Scoob. And I am definitely, I might do this in the future if I see other movies I want to ramble about. But otherwise, I'm just going to write scripts for stuff. So if you somehow watched all this until the end, thanks. Appreciate it. Bye.